Good morning and welcome to the fifth webinar in the series Best Practices for HPC Software. Today's speaker is Catherine Riley. Catherine is the Science Director at Argonne Leadership Computing Facility and she has been with the ALCF since its inception. She's talking today about um, how the HPC environment is different. Yes, Catherine. Thank you, Anshu. I can't.
my apologies, there was a technical hiccup there. Um, so first, let me thank you for for calling in today. We will have questions at the end, so um, please enter them right along along the side as part of as the talk is going forward, and we will we will have time at the end to address all of them. I'm going to talk today really about a sort of a broad category of things about why sort of as is often asked, why are supercomputers so hard to use? And I'll also clarify really what I'm talking about when I say hard to use and when I say supercomputer, exactly what category of supercomputer I'm talking about. Um, but really, in the end, these are going to cover four kind of topics, right? Just as what that one, we're talking about pretty unique resources when we're talking about supercomputers, especially within the DOE complex. I'm going to talk some about really how we drive these machines drive these supercomputers from the science side. And it's not just that we talk to it, but where science and applications and their requirements are incorporated into how we design these machines. So we are thinking about science from the beginning and not trying to make them hard, um, but trying to make them as best as we possibly can. And, and then to talk a little bit about what, what, I, what I describe in this talk of as ripples, really consequences, you know, from making, you know, one change either in the software stack and the hardware and how that follows through in, in the design of the resource. And the reason that's relevant is it helps to put into context, you know, why some things might not have been done on one machine, right? You know, why you can't do one thing or you can do something else. And talk a little <coughs> bit about a, uh, the process that the facilities are undergoing right now collaboratively even while all the facilities and the DOE complex are trying to do continuous improvement and make things better for people. Um, some some efforts we have going on today. One, one could say, by the way, about this talk that it could have been the, the introductory talk in the series and mostly due to scheduling issues. It was not. It's tr but it is trying to give a give a sense, right, create the space for what what we're talking about when we're talking about supercomputers and why they're challenging. But I'll start out really, really light and I get more more, more substantive after this. But it's really to, to draw this analogy, right, that we're not just talking about compute power, we're talking about where things are in the bleeding edge. And the reason is if you look at the iPad 2, which is powerful as the Cray 2, and if people were, were around at that point and using the Cray 2, um, or just know it historically, it, is an, it was an immensely powerful machine for its age. I mean, it was kind of overwhelming um, how how powerful it was, not just in terms of its flops, right, which are completely competitive with what this iPad 2 was, but also in terms of its memory footprint at two gigs of memory in 1985. That was really substantial. But we obviously don't talk about an iPad like as a supercomputer. It, it isn't. It might be, it might even have new and exciting technology in it. But in terms of scientific computing and on the bleeding edge of scientific computing, that's not really what we think about, right? So, so we're thinking really about what's pushing all aspects of high performance computing technology. So this slide that, that I switched to, I'm honest, the slide named top 1% has a lot of the compute power. It's to give you a real quantitative understanding of what I'm talking about when I talk about a supercomputer, because I'm not talking about necessarily number 200 on the list. So this is the first 100 along the x axis is the from the top 500 supercomputing list from June of this year. Um, that's you're just seeing the top 100 promise when and I tell you I hope you believe me that the, the the next 400 follow on in that same tail behavior. But you see on the left right their their peak not their theoretical peak their measured peak for performance. The top five machines on that list right have 30% of the total compute power and obviously this is this is the top 500 so it's mostly wind pack based but still the five machines have 30% of the total compute power on that list right last year and that's the number in parentheses was 24% and I, I use that as comparison just because right, we're still sort of incorporating into our ethos right the new computer coming out of China um, so you see really that this pull with the new machine from China pulled pulled the, those percentages even higher. In the top 10, you see 36%, right? 36% of the total power. And by the time you include the top 20, almost half, 44% of the entire power on that list has been covered. And the reason this is relevant, right, is, is there something different going on there? Those machines are not the same as number 400, and it does not mean that there's anything wrong with 400, and 400 might be an incredibly effective machine, but, but we're not talking about the same beasts. And part of what goes on here, right, is we're talking about machines that are deployed that, you know, we've often joked that they're serial number one or serial number two, but in reality, sometimes they're even pre-one, right? These are machines that when they're coming, 
to the facilities maybe have never been built before. And this was the case, say, with Mira, our, our current machine at the ALCF. IBM didn't have the floor space or the power to build all of Mira. So when they first came, brought it here and plugged it all together, we were dealing with, you know, what we could say a serial number 0.9, and we were really testing everything they had at scale as it was being installed. And so, as I said, often many of these things have never been, in, these machines have never been installed before. They might never be again. And we're talking about experimental hardware, maybe rare har hardware, our very first generation or first spin of hardware going on in these machines. Because the point is really to drive drive the technology as hard as possible. And that's relevant. That's relevant for the rest of the conversation as we understand that we're not, we're not putting down commodity parts. Okay, and this is, this is just two slides of, of a little description though to make sure everybody who's on the call understands sort of what ecosystem I'm coming from and talking about, right? So the Department of Energy's Office of Science, just their Office of Science comp computer facilities, right? Represent um, NERSC, from Berkeley National Lab, ALCF from Argonne, and OLCF from Oak Ridge. And these are to provide some of the most powerful computers to open science in the world. And I differentiate these as a, sometimes I talk about, you know, the, the NNSA labs in this context. Um, but I, I differentiate these because these are, especially ALCF and OLCF, targeted to, to open science. Why is that relevant to this conversation? It means it's a really broad range of requirements that we look at. We don't look at, you know, six apps or 10 apps <laughs> that are trying to solve a particular suite of problems. We have a, basically every problem that people might be thinking about using on these machines could be one that we have to plan for. Um, so this is a really also a relevant point is you understand that we're trying to make trade-offs and build what amounts to a general purpose, cutting edge, you know, bleeding edge machine as we're deploying our next generation. If you walk out of from this call with nothing else, what I want people to understand is that science and not just high level science descriptors, but applications, science applications and 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 um, and their requirements are used from the very beginning of the planning of these resources. From the first moment that we put out a mission need describing what we want, all the way through and we test and evaluate the machine, we have applications, real applications in our hand that we are using in collaboration with the vendor. Um, if you, you know, if you're curious, for example, NERSC has theirs up, you can very, very quickly find them. The, the link on this slide has the link to the Coral one. This is one that, that uh, Oak Ridge, Argonne, and Livermore used in their most recent acquisition. But you can see that these are a suite of applications, mini apps, and benchmarks that we're, what we're, that we're trying to do to capture a picture of what kind of requirements science apps put down. And I'll describe this a little bit more. What, while this seems like a, a, a project slide and, um, and maybe a little overwhelming, I, I really wanted to make sure that it was illustrated where we involve science applications in the process and over what time frame we're starting. So this is, this is purely a cartoon. This does not represent any particular project. Um, normally, historically, we have seen that from the very beginning, this mission need where we described to DWE why we need a particular computer, why we want to build it and make the case for building it. Those, that time period has often been five years. We expect we're, because of technology changes, we're seeing some of these time frames adjust. Um, so just mostly for, for illustration and perhaps utility, I expanded this to six years. But every place that there's a star, we are including science in the planning. Every place that there's a star, we're often bringing in a different suite even of applications or an additional suite of science apps that are trying to change how the machine is deployed. From the mission need side, we're still talking very high level science, but there's an RFP call in year two, right? And this is a call where we go out, we say to the vendors, here's some sample science applications. Show us how well the machine you might propose will, will do on these science applications. Give us a sense of how effective you'll be for a general workload that we're trying to describe. But I think even more interesting and that most people don't understand is really what goes on after we award contract and when the machine comes in. We are not just waiting, say, for our vendor, say Intel or Cray or IBM to deliver a machine. There's years of research, collaboration, system design and iterations with the vendors where we are working with applications to understand what they want. An example of that would be, you know, if they're working on re-architecting and redesigning their implementation of MPI, 
they don't want to do absolutely everything in MPI if they don't have to. They, and if nothing else, they want to know what things to prioritize, what are the most important functionalities in MPI that they can focus their time on so that they don't spend all their time on, a, on, a, on some function that, that only one app uses versus ignoring something that 20 apps that we want use. And so these are, are research and collaboration projects that often involve a lot of facility staff and iterations and bringing in, you know, and, and evaluating with new applications than were even involved, say, in the RFP call. The other one that most people might know, right, is that the projects the facilities, sorry, all have what is some flavor of early science. And that's a process where we make an open call, select projects to help us burn in the machine, to help us evaluate the machine and test it and figure out problems and bugs. Um, and this is something that happens before the machine comes, right? Before the machine is in delivery. And those projects start, they get on and are able to run before we go into production. Why that's interesting is it's not just because they help burn in the machine and figure out if there's any problems, but those provide another suite of applications that we use along with the vendor to understand what problems we're seeing on the machine, right? You know, to understand if there are compiler challenges or, or if the I.O. isn't performing up to this, to what we expected for applications. That's another stage, right, where we're using applications to drive what this machine looks like and more importantly, what capabilities this machine, uh, this machine will have. And, and finally, we use, you know, we use science in acceptance, right? Often those same benchmarks and applications that we use early on in the process are used to make sure that we accept these machines and they're good. So the summary point of this isn't to teach you about the project, the project process of acquiring a supercomputer, but to point out to you that the science staff at these facilities are engaged from the first moment these machines are conceived of and trying to incorporate science to make sure that the capabilities deployed are the most effective ones for science applications. Um, sometimes people don't quite believe us when we talk about this uh, because they're, they're frustrated maybe by a feature that they don't have, but we're trying to be as inclusive and comprehensive as possible, even acknowledging that there are people constraints. <coughs> and, and this is just a very quick slide to say that sort of, of course, right, I think everybody gets what we're trying to do is balance what these applications need with what technology is actually available at the time. We obviously have a budget constraint we have to work in, right? So we can't just throw down arbitrary amounts of memory because memory costs a lot and it also costs a lot to power and it costs a lot to cool, right? So we're constrained, for example, on between budget and technology about how much memory we might put down as an example. Or in terms of our interconnect, right? What we could actually deploy on an interconnect because the technology might not be there, right? We're not continuing on with a five-dimensional torus because the optics can't support that. We can't support the scale of bandwidth we'd need or, or pay for it. But the other aspect of this in terms of thinking about these machines is, is the future path. All three of these circles are approximately, are basically the same size and, and it's, it's not probably fair, right, because there are different ways. But we do think about whether these machines are advancing our applications in an effective path for where we see technology, right? So we don't want to pull people off to, you know, get their applications ready on a piece of hardware that will be defunct and not useful, right? We want to move people along in a path where we see the technologies going. So changes to applications might be relevant for more than one generation. All right. Um, and what I will say is this has had real impact. This is a very general slide, but this has had real impacts on what we do with these machines. For example, I mentioned the memory bandwidth and memory footprint. Both of these are the primary requests that we get from projects, right? They're not asking for flops and we appreciate that, right? Although we're in a period, as we always have talked about, right? That flops come very, very inexpensively, but it's that memory bandwidth and that footprint that's challenging. Um, and so we have made substantial choices and designs of machines that increase that footprint um, that might increase the total footprint, for example, but have a cost in terms of how much memory per node we have. But we have to come up with that balance. Um, I.O. is another really huge one that doesn't get talked about as much about, you know, what technologies we're using to implement our I.O. So our I.O. systems and whether those are effective for applications, whether those are ones that applications will be able to use without completely redoing I.O. again. But perhaps the most important one, I will say, is the software stack. It's a huge impact. I would say that software stack on a supercomputer is as important as the hardware for being able to use it. And 
a lot of that collaboration in that, you know, and so the sort of the timeline that you saw it with vendors is spent collaborating on what their software stack is capable of doing and where it can be optimized and improved what the applications need. And, and we have, we have seen that over and over again, you know, that we spent basically two and a half years with the vendors working on making a more effective software stack. All right. So we're getting into a bit of an analogy and what I wanted to point out is that performance really does matter on these machines and we don't have a lot of flexibility on things that we might decide to to save money on right so like perhaps well we decide that in terms of 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 designing this machine maybe we want to reduce the capability of the interconnect nobody's really asking for that right but there's a consequence if we want to just reduce the capability of the interconnect that, that we'd have less scaling more contention on the network and so much less capability for science than we were planning i choose the interconnect because it's a really obvious one and as i said very rarely have people said oh you don't need your interconnect it is even though it is the most important thing on a supercomputer but to illustrate right that 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 is though the type of question we get right where some people might say well i don't really care about x why did you choose x i care about y the problem is is that if you choose not to care about x there's a there's a ripple effect that will go through all of the machine and and perhaps even come around and and hit you i mean so one way to think about this is i'll go back to the network because i'm still mourning even though i had a lot of warning. I'm still going to mourn the 5D torus going the way that we have on Mira. We're not growing that because of the cost of building that topology, right? Building the optical network, right, of a 5D torus on the scale of machines we are seeing is, is cost prohibitive and the technology is not really there to do it. And there's a great talk that was recently given at ISC about this. So we're not growing the five dimensional torus. We're not moving forward with that, which means we need, a new, we need a new topology. As soon as we need a new topology, we need new algorithms in our MPI implementation, even in the hardware that is, is being used in the interconnect. Um, we, that might mean we need, 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 need new chips, right, within the actual hardware technology, but that might even mean that you need new node layouts, depending on how closely you're integrating the interconnect onto your nodes. And then that's going to impact your real estate for other things. And so there's these cascades of impacts for everything, right? And, and the most common one is the one on the right that people talk about. And I have it here just to illustrate, right? That as soon as you talk about, say, wanting more memory, and I'm just going to stick with memory, right? Memory or bandwidth. Well, as soon as you do that, you need to power it and you need to cool it. And that means that you have, you know, you need to power it. That means you have no more heat that you're generating. You need to cool it. Well, then, well, more effective cooling probably is going to mean you're going to have a higher density rack, probably water cooled, which means you need better floors. <laughs> and, and, and as I said, there's, there's all of these consequences. Now, I'm not saying that everybody has to know all of these things, but to understand that when we're designing the machines, we're not doing it arbitrarily, right? We're thinking about the consequence. For example, if we wanted to put, um, if we wanted to choose, say, to, to increase the density of the racks to get these few features, could we even afford to build the facility capable of supporting it? And, and that is an overlap both with technology and budget at that time. Um, so that's a, that's a really quick high-level description, right, you know, sort of, of how we think about these things when we're contemplating, well, do we choose this much high-density memory or high-bandwidth high memory versus, you know, this slower memory, and we try to come up with the most effective balance so that we can actually afford it and power it and use it. All right. So I'm going to go to, to actually jumping two slides immediately, but the, the scale jumps are tough, right? And they're still tough. And one of the most common questions we get is why are they still so challenging? And why is it still challenging to go from not just my laptop to a supercomputer, right? Because I think many people on the call might understand why your laptop does not look like a supercomputer, right? Why it lives alone and has different design priorities, right? Including being more user friendly and without contention than a supercomputer. But even in going from your laptop to a cluster, to Mira, to, an, to the next generation system of like 200 petaflops, they're, they're still challenging. And part of the reason why is because you have these, these ripples that go through the design as a result of trying to get that amount of capability on the floor. 
And so to convince you that I'm actually listening when people complain, this is not an ordered list. This is sort of the kind of way that, that we see this when we're talking to users about the things, it, I call this common challenges, but might also be described as things that people often complain about, right? And are frustrated by, or really in all honesty challenged by. I mean, it's not all negative, right? Some people really have hard limits, right, that they don't have an easy way around when they talk about memory per task. People really get frustrated by batch queuing, right? It does impact. We talk about supercomputers being so powerful because you can get an answer in 30 minutes that used to take you six months, but then you have to wait for two weeks in the queue. Um, and we understand these things, right? And we, we understand that challenge, right? We understand the, the challenges that you need a software stack that is effective. And I'm going to talk about some of these things, right? So as we sort of take these and organize them, where you take some of the hardware limitations of things like memory per task and scaling versus software problems, like, like the programming languages and models that you have available to you and the libraries that you have at scale available to you. We'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, why they're not always where you want them to be, why they're not at the scale that you see when you're using your cluster, for example, or effectiveness. And this is one of the reasons why. Now, I'm not going to ask you, and I'm not going to walk you through this slide. I mean, if you're if somebody's really curious, really curious about everything about this, send me an email and we can talk about this slide. But I'll describe what you're looking at. This slide is a really high level um, overview. In this particular case, it happens to be our ALCF3. So this is going to be Aurora, our next machine, our 200 petaflop machine coming in, um, in a few years, in a couple years. The reason I have this up here is to show you that in order to support the, the, the compute capability, what you have is basically an entire ecosystem of other, what I would say are, are medium to large scale cluster capabilities there, right? In order to support the IO file systems that you need to have on these, you have an entire other pretty complex network that needs maintenance, that needs, I mean, sorry, that needs, that needs design and support. And you have sort of often even like, you know, a, a, a mid tier of, of file system, right, that's helping move data quickly, right, this IO nodes and burst buffers. But in terms of managing front end nodes where people log in so they don't mess up the compute nodes, you've got a front end cluster, you've got like gateway nodes that are helping people manage all of their data. There's a lot of stuff here. And, and perhaps some, someone joked to me once that showing the slide was a little bit of just trying to muffle people by overwhelming them with things on a slide, but that's actually really not the goal. The goal is to try to describe that, you know, you have a lot of complexity. And so when, when for example, people start talking about, well, why is, why is IO so challenging and why is authentication so difficult and, you know, why can't I just SCP into the compute nodes? It's this kind of picture that starts describing why. This, this is a, no way saying that there's not room for improvement on just about everything, right? But we're not dealing with a simple scenario, right, where people say on the lower left come are, are, are FTPing into the, the facility and going straight to the compute nodes. You have to come in through different stages. And there is really good software, for example, today to help you manage some of this, right? Globus has it's got some great capabilities to help people manage the complexity of this and of moving data. Um, and so we're taking small steps forward, but but this is why I show this to you, to, to make sure that people understand we're not dealing with direct lines into places, you know, that, that, that they're just being denied. There's a pretty complex infrastructure that really is, is architected very carefully to make sure that the, the facility operates as effectively as possible. So, so moving from that, right, we, talking about ripples, right, I'll tell you that, that one of the most common ones that we talk to people about, I think many people understand this, right, which is that scaling on 1K is more difficult, I'm oh, sorry, is easier than on 10,000K nodes versus 100K nodes, right, that these scales, like these order of magnitude jumps have complexities and, and they're harder. And many people understand that within the scope of their application capability, right? That there are maybe part of their physical model or the way they've implemented their algorithms or what have you, there are limitations there. Um, but there's also implications on the hardware side, right, for these. For, and these are not, these are not comprehensive lists. Um, but that things like jitter, right, which is really represented in the compute nodes, jitter has a huge implication on, on the scalability of a system. What jitter is, is you've got a, if you've got an operating system on your compute nodes that's doing things like letting people log in, 
um, that's doing things like intermittently checking to see if um, somebody has done something bad or checking if it needs to load some dynamic libraries or something like that. Every time you add a functionality to an operating system, it it's going to interfere with what the operating system is doing on the compute nodes, and that causes jitter, and that causes imbalance in the application, which limits the scalability. It was actually really illustrated well when like the first blue gene came out. And this is a good example of sort of a hardware ripple. They were trying to create this incredibly scalable machine on the blue gene L, and as a result, they gave you a compute node that basically did not have an operating system. And had, you know, well, they called it, there was an OS, it was kind of more like a, just a bootloader. <laughs> and you could do whatever you wanted, including write, overwriting your memory. But the thing that was amazing about the blue gene L, despite a lot of complexities and challenges using it, is that you scaled amazingly because you had no jitter throwing off your balance. So if you, your algorithms are ready, you scaled. And, um, sorry, sorry, you, you, you scaled and it was completely reproducible because again, you didn't have this operating system getting in the way of, of what your application was doing. And I jumped over in this talking about networking technology and software, right? We, this is a real honest band, uh, a bottleneck right now that technology and cost and network technology has to advance right and we will see challenges at scaling in the next you know in moving up in terms of scale as network technology has to catch up with the immense capability that's going to be on some of the nodes some of the other hardware ripples right are that you you have the without a joke as i said a large amount of of ops capable of being exposed on a machine, really. Like these nodes are huge. They have a large computational capability, a huge density. But how do you expose those, right? How do you expose that? They're putting so much on there and they're coming up with so many ways to give you this computational capability that that introduces challenges, right? That introduces challenges really, particularly say on the software stack, right? If you have not just an operating system capable of handling that, but libraries that are capable of getting ported and understand the complexities and the intricacies of optimizing for that particular hardware. Okay. So the software ripples, and you might think, well, I was just talking about software, and this goes back to my premise that I sort of feel like software really is the core of this, right? Hardware is important. We need to build a good machine that we're able to use, but if we don't have good software for it, then we can't use it. Um, and this is one of the reasons we work so hard with the vendor to, to make sure that what we get as a stack on the machine is as effective as we can get. But, but fundamentally, right, we're talking about bleeding edge hardware that often we have as much experience with as the vendor does. Maybe the vendor has like a couple months ahead of us in some, in some cases, right? But in terms of getting that software to work, there's not a large lead time. There's not a large reuse, right, of, of code in many respects. <sighs> So there is time that takes to get third-party tools, let alone, you know, not, not in, if we're not thinking about the vendor tools, but third-party tools need time, right, to scale and be functional. Um, and as I mentioned, right, the, com the compute OS can be a challenge for people because you don't have the same capabilities as you have on your laptop or even your cluster. Your cluster still might be running an HPC-oriented kernel, but that's still going to have more capability than is often available on a on the OS sitting on the compute nodes on one of these big machines. And so to go a little bit further to the software stack, again, not asking you to internalize everything here, but I'll tell you kind of what you're seeing so, so that you understand some complexity. This is kind of a, a cartoon of what a software stack looks like on these machines. That you start at the very lower lowest level where you're talking about like the hardware BIOS firmware the things that are directly talking to the hardware and every stage you move up you're sort of moving further from the, the hardware and the wires and closer to the applications at top and and there's absolutely a case to be made maybe there are things that live on top of the applications but but as I said this is meant to be a cartoon not comprehensive and when you are sitting down with your applications, there's things you are immediately touching. And these are the things in red, right? You're sitting down, you want to log in and compile your code. You need to use your libraries like MPI um, or OpenMP. You might have third-party tools like maybe HDF5 that you're trying to use, right? You're going to interact with the resource manager, so things like the scheduler and perhaps even the network management, depending on what your application's doing. Um, but then if you look at, this is 
maybe you have perhaps a challenge in color choice, but the purple ones are things like the interconnect drivers and APIs and the operating system. A lot of applications still touch those. They're not pervasive. Not every single application tries to talk to the API for the interconnect, but many do in an, in an attempt to really get the as much as they possibly can out of the hardware. And then the, the compute kernel and the file systems, Again, some of the apps will notice these, but the reason I, I point this out is that apps go pretty deep in this list. Applications have a reasonable chance of going down very close to really the BIOS level and the firmware on these machines. Very few go to the firmware, but they get very close. And that means when you're taking this app, an application that's going down that low, right, and going from one bleeding edge piece of hardware to another, um, there's there's a lot of impact. There's a large ripple impact of changing the API on a network, right? You know, if you're changing go, or going from one machine to another, like one vendor to another, clearly some of these things are going to change. So, so this is something that that we try very hard to keep in mind when we're making sure what we have available is useful for people that we're trying to reduce as much as possible, who wants to go down, say, to the, the compute kernel and the operating system levels, and, and perhaps even going down to the network APIs so that people can be more portable. But in the end, as I firmly believe, most scientific computing programming, I mean, time to solution really does matter. And so most people want to do this. But you're going down very close to the interface for bleeding edge hardware. The other one, and I, and I won't talk as long about this, you can have this for reference, but but that also in the software stage, right, one reason things are challenging right now is we are having to play catch up in many ways, right? Our programming models are not fully caught up with where we are today. So we are not in a mode, right, where we were 10 years ago, where for the most part, if you had, you had a C or a Fortran code with MPI, and you could take that from Oak Ridge to Argon or to NERSC, and for the most part, you'd probably be able to, to compile it Perhaps if you had a lot of libraries that were dependent, you might just have to bring some of those with you. We do have things like different requirements for OpenMP on one place versus OpenACC somewhere else. I'm not saying that anybody's requiring OpenACC or OpenMP, but in terms of exploiting the most out of these things, for example, that the, these are very diverse right now. And, in, and in addition, the programming models and the programming languages we have are sort of set thinking about sort of a previous era where different things were important. Um, and so while people might argue with exactly some things I say here, like on a particular line, for the most part, I think most people agree today that even the programming models that we have are, are catching up to where the hardware is and catching up to the kind of portability and performance expectations that, that scientific computing often has. And so this is a, this is a real one and it's one that, that we are that we are very engaged in, but also adds some complexity and why, why using these machines is more challenging than, say, switching from cluster to cluster, where in many respects from cluster to cluster you can control, well, I'm just going to avoid that machine that requires X, Y, or Z um, that I don't have in my application today. And this is really stuff that I've already talked about in some respects, the application ripples, meaning that that I really do believe that most of the reason people want to use HPC for science is, is about performance. It's not just that they want to get the flop, it's that they're trying to accelerate their time to solution, and that is a, me that is a performance metric, right? And, and these machines are optimized for that, right? And not optimized, say, just how fast can you open up your PowerPoint? And so if, depending on where you're developing your code, even different capabilities are there. We know, and this is sort of moving into sort of the last couple bits of my, my talk, we know that there are challenges in the development environment um, and, and we are working to help improve that situation. One thing though that I, I did want to at least comment on, right, is that many people have, are asking these days, well, you know, sort of it, are containers the answer? Will containers make, make it trivial, right, for, for supercomputing to sort of be the service and, and I can take what I have on my laptop and just drop it on, on the supercomputing? on a supercomputer and, and, and use it there without having to have any worries about portability. And I will say that I, I strongly believe that containers are promising, right? So this idea of being able to take a snapshot of what you're using and move it from one machine to another. But they still need a lot of investigation, I think, in HPC. And, and that work is ongoing at all, all of the computing facilities right now. Um, there are things that they 
introduce, right, which are in direct contradiction in some cases to things that we're specifically fighting against. And jitter is one of these, for example, right? They do a lot, introduce a lot of jitter and overhead. So if you're really trying to get performance while using a container, you might have challenges today. And we know this is one of the things that we're, and, and we're, we're working closely on that. Um, they're working on trying to figure out how you can still get exposed to optimized libraries, right? If you're taking the, the environment that's on your laptop, and you're moving it directly to a supercomputer while well, you're taking the environment and the library that is using optimization, say, for your laptop, not optimization for the supercomputing hardware that you're using. And so there's also work there to be done to make sure we understand how you can get access to those optimized libraries. And related to those two things really is scalability. So understanding how we can actually get the scalability. This is related to also challenges with I.O. But this is one, which is one very promising trend, right, that it's a good technology that we're, we're looking into, but I don't think anyone should stand up and say it is the answer and I will have containers tomorrow like, on my supercomputer and that will answer all the problems, right? Because we're still talking about an environment that does care about performance and, the, and we need to explore with containers how we can deliver that. Uh, this is mostly a, a slide for you to go back maybe and, and read a little bit of later on, but there's a lot of effort right now to understand what kind of environment the, the community does want. There have been reviews um, with the different program offices, say within the Department of Energy that the facilities have been running. There's a lot of other ways we collect requirements through, through meetings with our users and, and conversations. And, and things that, so these are examples of some of the things that we're talking to people about so we understand what kind of requirements they have, what they're really seeing as being prohibitive in their moving forward using do these very large machines over the course of the next like 10 years. Some of these are straightforward, like I've talked about, right? It's a real, it's a large issue when you have a programming models challenge um, or you have to keep three copies of your code so you can use the different requirements at different facilities. Um, and we know this and we're working on trying to improve that computing environment. Um, we're collaborating on that and we're collaborating with the larger research and community as well. Um, but these are really there, there as I said, as, as a reference. So you understand that we are trying to collect these requirements. We're trying to act on them too. We're really trying to move the environment forward to be friendlier. But I will say that, that no matter what, right, these machines are still rare beasts. I don't know that I personally foresee a situation where these machines suddenly become really trivial to use because we're always gonna be talking about hardware that's at the cutting edge always talking about sort of pushing our capabilities so that we're really working at, at getting the science and engineering questions done at, at the earliest time possible. Um, so as I said at the beginning, the biggest thing I want people to walk away from knowing is that we consider science very closely when we're designing these machines, when we're thinking about the software stack, when we're collaborating on the software stack. We incorporate science through actual applications, right? Through you know, the code that people are using to run their science as, as we're collaborating with them. And the other one really is that everything counts in the design of these, right? That there, there is wiggle room, but, but there are consequences as we change one thing, right? There's a lot of other things that might, that might fall out of that. Um, and so we try to pay very close attention to it. And, and as I said most recently, right, we, we are continuously working on improving this environment and this ecosystem. Um, and I think right now is actually a pretty exciting time to start talking about that because of collaborations that facilities have and because of the collaborations that facilities have with research. All right. Um, Thank you. I, there is one question that came earlier and that is, what is a compute kernel? My apologies. Um, so a compute kernel, uh, depending on the context, I don't remember exactly where I said this, but I use this in two ways. One of them is if we're talking about an application, a compute kernel might be a small part of that application where you're really focused on a lot, uh, there's a lot of interesting operations going on. Like, so it might be very operation dense. Like maybe you're doing a particularly interesting matrix, matrix multiply or something like that, you know, or a challenging one. And so we often pull those compute kernels out, right, in order to focus on understanding how that particular thing will be optimized. There's another way that I use that, um, which is the operating system kernel. And so the operating system on a compute node, which is different than the operating system 
on your, even your front end node on one of these machines because they have different capabilities that are enabled. And so sometimes the kernel is used to refer to that operating system image. I have a question of my own actually. Um, and this is um, regarding containers. How do you see containers addressing platform heterogeneity? <laughs> It is of no help to say I'm not sure right now. <laughs> that I think that if we are able to answer the question of how containers could effectively deal with, for example, accessing the different optimized libraries, you know, then at least that would give you access, right, for real heterogeneous systems to the optimized capabilities. I don't feel like they will ever address the algorithmic challenges of real heterogeneous systems. Um, if, if this is what you mean, right? They're not going to suddenly be able to let you write one single application that will just be able to, in a container, effectively use you know, a GPU-based machine versus a many-core machine. We'll still have that challenge, but it could help with the portability. Right? If you know you're targeting a many-core machine, for example, you're working on that, and you know it's functioning even on your, your cluster, you know, not to make it too big of a jump, it can help with that step. So you can get to functionality faster. Which means what you're implying is that if you want to use the container technology, you'd better have a mini represented, a mini, I would say, platform similar to the one that you intend to use. Yes. And and we've actually done like small small forays into this, right? Meaning not, not that we're creating full containers or, you know, or virtual machines that are like having a mini Mira, for example, on your laptop. But our goal has been to do things, for example, like get the compiler on your laptop, right? You can download, you know, you can have basically the, the open source version of the compiler that we use on Mira so that you can at least deal, for example, with that level of complexity, right? Compilers have complexities in their own beasts and their own challenges. So, so we're trying to do some of that even today is available, but yes, the container would allow, would hopefully, right? And like the grand happy, the, the, the grand big vision might allow that be an easier, to, to be an easier step. Um, another user question, how do you see the future path for GPUs and KNL? Are there containers for this today? Um, so, it, so I will interpret the question and if not, just ask if, if I interpret it in the way you didn't intend, just ask it again. So our goal for, for example, our, our deployment of a, of our KNL machine theta today is that we will have containers functional on this machine um, eventually, right? Not, not the day it turns on, but we think we will be able to have some capability with containers, at least functionality, even if not performance relatively quickly. Um, so I, I can't speak necessarily where we'll see that go with Summit for Titan's machine. Um, and this is not because it's just, I, I, I have not been in that conversation, but The benefit, right, that they might bring is particularly in complex software stacks. And so this is where I want to clarify. I, I don't know that users today who have their science code written in C or Fortran or C++ or you know, what have you will ever really need to switch to containers unless we come up with some incredibly clever solutions that really do allow you to have like the mini, the mini machine, right, the mini Aurora on your laptop. The containers offer a big benefit if you are coming in with a large, complicated stack of requirements. Like you, you're, for example, dealing with a very complex workflow situation, right? And, and you're trying to get to some functionality before, you know, to, to, to test whether this will work versus trying to port, you know, 20 different, suite, 20 different things that would otherwise be available. And that's where on these large machines, I first see containers really providing a benefit, is it provides that inroad to working that right now would have a really large overhead. And by overhead, I mean time overhead to get everything up and going. Um, no more questions. Um, thank you, Catherine. Do you have the last slide I about do. the next? Yes. Right. So the next webinar in the series will be on July 28th, Thursday, and that will be an introduction to high performance parallel IO. Um, the, it's the same same time. Okay. Thank you. A last call for any further questions, if anybody has. All right. Thank you for joining. Goodbye.